Mortal Kombat is a rare example of a fighting game series where the story is a crucial part of the experience. Over the course of over three decades, and across nearly a dozen mainline installments, not to mention multiple spin-offs, the franchise has continued to place an increasingly large emphasis on its lore, characters, and narrative. And with multiple timelines, thousands of years of backstory, a massive and rotating cast of crucial characters, and countless conflicts between more than just a few factions, it's gotten to a point where, pretty much by design, it's become an absolute behemoth of narrative content, especially if you're talking about pure volume. With the upcoming Mortal Kombat 1, the franchise will be rebooting itself yet again, but as we all know too well at this point, Mortal Kombat never truly hits the reset button. As the 2011 reboot proved, even a reboot is a sequel in disguise. While it remains to be seen how tangibly connected to the past games Mortal Kombat 1 will be, there is little doubt in anyone's mind that it will, at the end of the day, still serve as a continuation that stems from the events of previous entries. As such, over the course of the next few weeks and months, we're going to take a deep dive into the franchise and recount its entire story, from beginning to end, in as much detail as possible. Given just how much there is to cover, we're going to be doing this in multiple parts. Here, in part 1, we'll be going over important lore and backstory details, before then talking about pivotal events that take place before the events of the original Mortal Kombat, and finally talking about the events portrayed in the series' very first game itself. Without further ado then, let's get started. To understand Mortal Kombat's story, we have to back up to the very beginning. The beginning of what? Well, everything. Upon the beginning of time, before the universe even existed, there existed three entities, the one being the Elder Gods and Titans. The Titans, however, won't figure into the larger story for a while yet. The one being's rule lasted an impossibly long time, though it did not go on forever, because eventually there arrived a point where the Elder Gods decided that a change was needed. Using their powers, they made six incredible powerful weapons, relics known as Kamidagu, that had the power to make an unmake reality and tear the very fiber of existence. If wielded by the wrong hands, using the Kamidagu, the Elder Gods were able to defeat the One Being, though its defeat wasn't absolute. The One Being was split apart into six different pieces, and though it was gone, its spirit and consciousness still lingered on in those pieces. This also went hand in hand with the creation of six different realms, different planes of existence scattered throughout the universe, each holding one of the Kamidogu as well as a piece of the One Being's consciousness. These six realms were Earther Realm, which, as its name suggests, is our Earth. Outworld, a realm ruled by warfare and populated by barbaric tribes that are always in conflict. Edenia, a lush and fertile world of peace and beauty. Order Realm, a realm where law and order are sacrosanct. Chaos Realm, where anarchy reigns supreme and Nether Realm, which is literally hell. On top of these six main realms, several smaller realms were also created. Though, for the majority of this series recap, we're going to be focusing on these six. Through the pieces of its consciousness scattered throughout the realms, the One Being continued to exert some limited influence, through which it would try and compel the rulers of the realms to invade other realms and merge with them with its end goal being to have all six realms merged into a single world, which in turn would bring about its return to its true form. And sure enough, plenty of conflict ensued between the realms, prompting the Elder Gods to come up with a solution that would help them keep these conflicts in check. The Elder Gods enacted a martial arts elimination tournament that they called Mortal Kombat, that the purpose of which was essentially to regulate invasions and mergers of realms, the concept of Mortal Kombat came with a number of hard and fast rules, chief among them being that if a realm can, through its chosen champion, win 10 tournaments in a row, it would have the right to merge with the losing realm. Mortal Kombat could, however, only be invoked once every 50 years, and if it was invoked, the defending realm would not have the option to refuse it. The creation of the Mortal Kombat tournament surely regulated invasions and mergers, but it did not stop them. One realm in particular that proved to be extraordinarily hungry for war and conquest was Outworld. 
Initially under the rule of its original rule, known as Onaga, the Dragon King, it grew in power, with Onaga uniting all of Outworld's warring tribes and factions due to the threat of invasion from Netherrealm. Eventually, Onaga was betrayed by his trusted advisor, Shao Kahn, who would go on to poison his master and take control of Outworld for himself. Under Shao Kahn's rule, Outworld invaded and conquered a number of territories, but its biggest victory would come with the invasion of Adenia. Intending to merge the lush, gleaming realm with Outworld and bring it under his control, Shao Kahn invoked Mortal Kombat, and after winning 10 tournaments in a row in spite of Adenia sending its best champions forward, Outworld merged with the realm and took control of it. In doing so, Shao Kahn killed Adenia's ruler, King Jirad, took his wife Sindel as his queen, and at her behest adopted their daughter, Kitana, as his own. Kitana would go on to be put through rigorous training, following which she would become Shao Kahn's personal guard and elite assassin. Of course, with Adenia in his grasp, Shao Kahn was now more powerful than ever, and as is often the case with evil supervillains, he was far from satisfied with what he had been able to accomplish. He wanted more, more than what he already had, more than Adenia. He wanted the jewel of the universe, the realm that he knew would make him and Outworld the undisputed rulers of the universe and make his reign absolute. And so his attention turned to Earthrealm. Shao Kahn set plans in motion that would allow him to eventually conquer Earthrealm, which of course would need Outworld to win 10 consecutive Mortal Kombat tournaments against it. For this purpose, Shao Kahn entrusted his advisor, a powerful sorcerer named Shang Tsung, with invoking and winning tournaments against Earthrealm. And though he did go on to win a few tournaments and become crown champion for each of them, he was unable to put together the streak that Outworld and Shao Kahn needed. That, of course, is because Earth wasn't just going to lie down and not defend itself. Raiden, who had been appointed as the protector of Earthrealm, rallied together the realm's best fighters and formed a secret society known as White Lotus whose express purpose was to train its fighters and choose champions who would represent and defend the realm in Mortal Kombat tournaments. One such champion was the supremely skilled martial artist known as the Great Kung Lao, who defeated Shang Tsung in one particular tournament and became its champion, successfully defending Earth. The Great Kung Lao showed mercy, however, and decided to let Shang Tsung live, which proved to be a mistake because Shang Tsung would then go on to decide that if he was to fulfill Shao Kahn's wishes and deliver Earthrealm to him, he would need to up his game and string together 10 Mortal Kombat victories as soon as possible. For this purpose, Shang Tsung chose a new champion to fight in his stead, Goro, the prince of a half-human, half-dragon race from the outworld known as Shokan. Not only did he have four arms and also incredible and terrifying strength to match, Goro would go on to kill the Great Kung Lao, and proved so powerful that he was able to string nine Mortal Kombat victories together. That meant Outworld needed just one more victory to be able to successfully conquer Earthrealm. With the fate of Earth hanging in the balance, Raiden, knowing how much was at stake, chose three warriors to represent and defend the realm alongside him in the next Mortal Kombat tournament, Shaolin Monk and former White Lotus warrior Liu Kang. Johnny Cage, who is a Hollywood star and a skilled martial artist with a point to prove, and Special Forces agent Sonya Blade, who's on the hunt for a man named Kano, who's part of a criminal mercenary organization known as the Black Dragon. Outworld, meanwhile, would also be represented by four warriors, Goro, now hungrier than ever to assert his dominance over all foes and unwilling to stop at anything to win a 10th straight tournament. The aforementioned Kano, harboring secret notions to infiltrate Shang Tsung's palace and steal its vast stockpiles of gold, Scorpion, a skilled assassin of the Shirai Ryu clan of ninjas, and Sub-Zero of the Lin Kuei clan of ninjas, and also an assassin. We're now entering the original Mortal Kombat story, but before we do, we do need to lay some groundwork for those latter two characters in particular, Scorpion and Sub-Zero who, to put it mildly, have massive beef with each other. We'll be going into much greater detail about the long and complicated history of these two characters and the origins of their conflict in future parts. But for now, here is what you need to know. The Shirai Ryu and Lin Kuei clans are locked in a furious feud, which ultimately culminated in the complete destruction of the Shirai Ryu clan and the death of Scorpion. Scorpion was eventually brought back to life and believing that Sub-Zero was responsible for his death and the destruction of his clan, 
swore vengeance against him. As such, killing Sub-Zero was primarily why Scorpion agreed to fight for Outworld in the tournament. Knowing that his rival would be there as well, Sub-Zero meanwhile was there because he had been secretly hired by his clan to kill Shang Tsung. Why exactly? Again, we'll get to that in future parts. But yeah, now we finally arrived at the events of the original Mortal Kombat game, which was released over three decades ago in 1992. By this time, Goro has been undefeated for 500 years, and Shang Tsung has the tournament in a tight iron grip, to the point where it's become almost completely corrupted and nearly impossible to win for any opposing outworld. With the realm needing just one tournament victory to bring Earthrealm under its shadow, the forces of Outworld and Earthrealm duke it out in the tournament, and ultimately, Liu Kang was able to defeat all of his foes, including Goro. The Shokan Prince is presumed dead, while newly crowned champion Liu Kang also goes on to challenge and defeat Shang Tsung, who flees to Outworld in defeat. Meanwhile, during the tournament, Scorpion and Sub-Zero also lock horns, and the former is successful in avenging his own death by killing Sub-Zero and sending him to the depths of Netherrealm. That's where we leave things off at the end of the original Mortal Kombat, though there is, of course, a great deal of story to be told. When we return for Part 2, we'll be going over the events of Mortal Kombat 2, dive further into the story of Scorpion and Sub-Zero, and cover a few more things that will set up the series events that are even further off. Hey, did you know that we at Gaming Bolt upload new videos every day? Stick around, drop a like, subscribe, and hit that bell, and let us know what kind of content you'd like to see in the future with a comment below.